Now I have nothing to fear. It's because I've seen the great works of God. You will be able to have a spiritual experience. This means you have the time of confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. May we all greet one another. May we be able to proclaim of the heavens. With that, the title for today is The Vessel Chosen by God. Today's passage is from the book of Acts chapter 9. It begins with the incident in Damascus where the evangelist Apostle Paul has changed. Following the martyrdom of Stephen, there was great persecution in Jerusalem, and among the leaders of this persecution was Saul. Saul's Hebrew name is Paul. Saul, who was enthusiastic in his work, was a core member of Judaism. And he didn't seize his passion in Jerusalem, and he went to seize the people who believed in Jesus in Damascus. <clears throat> And that's why he went to Damascus, in a state filled with threats and fierceness. He had a letter from the high priest granting him legal authority to seize people who believed in Jesus. From Saul's perspective, he firmly believed that this is the work that would please God the most. That's what he believed in. But on his way to Damascus, on the road, he, his life took a turn as he encountered the resurrected Jesus. It totally changed his life around. One theologian said if there are two great incidents in the book of Acts, one would be the incident of the Pentecost, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the other would be the incident of Saul's conversion when he met Jesus. To that extent, after the Pentecost and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the great incident that follows is when Saul met Jesus. This meeting is not an ordinary meeting. If the martyrdom of Stephen became a fuse for spreading the gospel to the Gentiles, as the gospel only stayed in Jerusalem, the incident of Damascus, where Saul met the resurrected Jesus, became the priming powder for spreading of the gospel. And that's how we see it. A life turning point. For Saul who had just experienced the turning point of his life, the gospel spread like a blazing active volcano. And that's how he was used. That one person, <clears throat> that one person's conversion, that one person's assurance and passion. We can see how important that is. In today's passage, in verse 15, God grants us the spiritual identity to Saul when he was prepared for the sake of spreading the gospel. Verse 15 reads, For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the king and the children of Israel. That is the identity. Saul was chosen by God as an instrument and vessel for the sake of the Gentile world evangelization, which in today's terms refers to the evangelization of the 237 nations and 5,000 people groups. It said he was prepared to be used by God. We must experience two types of grace. One is that I am a child of God that is born again. I am chosen as a child of God. I am a child of God. Ephesians 1, 3, 5 states the spiritual truth. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in the name before the foundation of the world 
that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. All we did is sin, but this is a heavenly blessing. We've lived a life that is opposite from the Bible, but before creation, He has called us and let us give worship. What is enjoying this blessing of salvation? Starting from this is the walk of faith. I've received salvation. Is that true? Did you receive salvation? Did you receive salvation? Even if you are in sin, those who believe in Jesus have received salvation. Even if you are in difficult circumstances, even if you are hurting, if you believe in Jesus, you are a child of God, you have received salvation. The introductory things of the world that is all temporary does not matter because you have received the ultimate salvation, which is endless. A book I wrote on the book of Ephesians has been published. It is called A Life-Saving Platform. And it provides a detailed truth on how spiritual lives can become a platform and how we can live a victorious spiritual life. I encourage all of you to only meditate on these words again. And I hope you will share this book as a gift with those who are living religious a life, a religious life, and the people who are praying to evangelize when you have time study and organize the book and if so that is something to inherit to your children saying this is how you're going to live are you going to give them cash they're not going to be satisfied may you pass on the spiritual inheritance i've organized this word and now i'm going to go to heaven with that, like me, may you do the walk of faith. May you pass down the spiritual inheritance. If so, that will be a spiritual inheritance. Because many people, after a week, they forget the word. I have to make a living for you to forget. And you always get beaten. So many people, they just they read it, but you have to make your own notes. You have to highlight it, circle it, and your remo where you receive grace. And if you do so, if you open that, and there are those elders where those elders open those notes and they pray. But for many people, they don't know how to pray. See how you organize the word and pray with that to the point where you don't need that later on. May you wholly meditate on the word, those who do religious lives. It is a vague life. If you ask them, they don't know anything. They don't know. So, Give this as a gift, saying, read this, then God will give you great blessings. So may you be able to utilize this book as a contact point for the team of three and the three movements. And the word recorded in today's word of the 66 books in the Bible is also published. <coughs> So the word recorded in today's passage is about the second grace of election given to us. It is giving us salvation, giving us the calling from commission. It is crucial to have the spiritual consciousness that we have been chosen as instruments for saving lives. Look behind your past. Look at your family line. Think, why did I come to this field, this workplace? Oh, it is making so that person would be able to receive salvation. It's
It's not thinking about my benefits, money. Those who are very calculative of those things, it's not standard. Our meeting is not a coincidence. It is within the plan of God. Amen? So even if it's a brief meeting, a brief meeting in the car bank bus station, he has granted you that meeting to preach the gospel. God has chosen you as a tool and an instrument to save souls. You must have the spiritual thought the moment you have that you'll have spiritual growth. It's an order to save lives and it's to prepare that. So it's different from many other things. It's a time of concentration when you listen to the word. Your posture is different. How you look is different. Your eyes are different. Even if you're told not to pray, you pray because you have your feel, because you have the feel to preach the gospel. So you pray through those lips. You proclaim that Jesus is the Christ, and you have no choice but to proclaim that. And it's nothing else. It is 24 hours. For that, God has called you. Within that, there is a masterpiece of 25 hours. And that is the answer, 24 and 25. 25 is not what belongs to us. To that extent, God is responsible and guides us. All the Yoan church believers do today's word. It is enough to thank God for choosing and saving us, and moreover, for bringing us to Yoan church for the sake of evangelizing the 237 nations and 5,000 people groups, and giving us the grace to be used for this purpose. So, the codes and the 237 elders are all on the wall. We're so thankful to receive salvation. But being able to proclaim the gospel, establishing and raising the Bartas and formations, we should be thankful. How thankful are we? As I carry out the church work in the year 2023, may you abundantly experience this grace and be able to see how it's a multi-blessing, a multi-gift. May you be able to experience this. God has chosen me as his vessel. It's a spiritual identity. It's not, should I go to the Buddhist temple? Should I go to Catholicism? But it's that God has chosen you as his vessel. We have the spiritual identity. So I bless you in the name of the Lord that may all church believers stand as transcendent witnesses of blessing possessing all the nations. Number one, the change persecutor Saul. Acts 9, 1 to 2 reads, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The persecution that started after Stephen's martyrdom couldn't discourage the Christians. Instead, it became an opportunity for them to preach the gospel in different regions and countries. This persecution became an opportunity to preach the gospel. In the midst of persecution, the gospel was also preached in Damascus, and the number of believers grew even more upon persecution. Think about the Korean War. There were many hurts, but the region of Pyongyang was Jerusalem. So many Christians were there, and there were great revivals. But as there was no gospel being preached, it was all scattered. And that's why the gospel was so scattered, and you must know that. By persecution and wars, it is scattered. Damascus? Where is this Damascus? Does it seem vague? It's still there, as it was said in the Bible. 
If you go on the pilgrimage, you'll be able to see those places. It's still there. Damascus, the capital of Syria, is located 240 kilometers north from Jerusalem and was one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. It's still there. And although Syria is in war, Damascus still exists. At that time, Damascus was one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. It was a time when Rome had ruled the whole world. At the time, there were around 40,000 Jews. And there were 30 synagogues in Damascus. And many Christians fled to Damascus to escape from the persecution, but continued to preach the gospel there, going into the synagogue. So hearing this, Saul couldn't remain still. He went all the way there saying, how can you preach the gospel going all the way there to our, our Jews to preach the gospel? And this news awakened Saul as he knew these fled Christians will go into the synagogues in Damascus and transform many Jews. And Saul went into the, the synagogues to arrest them. And he went to the high priest and asked for a warrant to arrest any believers, regardless of their gender, and set out towards Damascus. He was in rage. Acts 9, 35 reads, Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. These verses are the scenes where Saul's life underwent a 180 degree transformation through his encounter with the resurrected Jesus Christ. As Saul was headed towards Damascus, a light from heaven shone upon Saul. Acts 26, Apostle Paul described this light as a light from heaven brighter than the sun. And the sun that shone upon Saul was so intense that he fell to the ground. And he went blind because the light was so strong. And then he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? And then Jesus answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul's persecution was not only directly towards the believers, but fundamentally aimed towards Jesus himself. Jesus. It was towards Jesus. The resurrected Jesus personally appeared to Saul to render his efforts fertile in persecution. The intense light that shone upon Saul was so strong that it blinded his eyes, and he had to be led by others' hands to be brought into Damascus. Imagine how big of a shock he had experienced. I am Jesus whom you persecute. Upon this voice, his perfect life, his perfect theology, law, religion, it was scattered. There are many great efforts of the wrong laws. Saul is the same way. A religious life with its great deeds. 
the incident of Damascus is referred to the theology referred to the theology theology of Saul's conversion. Although we often use the expression such as repentance and renewal rather than conversion, there is an important spiritual significance to the word conversion. Conversion encompasses not only a change of heart, but also tangible changes in daily life and personality. It means completely breaking down the old frames and adopting a new one. In the following scripture, Saul was converted immediately after the team ministry of Ananias, one of the 70 disciples commissioned by Jesus that Saul began proclaiming that Jesus was the Son of God in the synagogues. People who heard him about him were astonished because they had previ previously come to arrest those who believed in Jesus. How did he make such a 180 degree turn and become a witness for Jesus? Despite the reactions from the people around him, Saul and Paul the Holy Spirit boldly testified Jesus as the Christ, making the Jewish living in Damascus perplexed. He showed such compelling evidence that the Jewish people conspired to kill him. And Saul was completely transformed after the experience in Damascus. He didn't hesitate or have any doubts. He did it immediately. So think about all the Jews who were confused. The reactions of the field did not matter. With more strength, he proclaimed that Jesus is the Christ. And to the Jews who were living in Damascus, he proclaimed this and they were so shocked and perplexed. And that's why there were teams who were saying to kill Saul. The moment that he was able to believe in Jesus, this happened. He didn't hesitate. He didn't look back. He didn't have any doubts until the day of his martyrdom with this commission. Like Saul, those who have been changed by the Holy Spirit, what is the characteristic? It is one heart, whole heart, continuation. So you may think, oh, there are difficulties. There are people who are so let down, but that's all fake. There's no need. Those who are born again with the Holy Spirit, the environment has nothing to do with me. That no matter what attack it is, it doesn't matter. It is one heart, whole heart, and continuation. Look at Saul. Until the moment of his martyrdom, one heart, whole heart, and continuation. So it's the life of only in concentration. It's only. It's not thinking about it, having counseling. It's only. And our walk of faith may have a turning point where the persecutor Saul becomes a fully changed preacher, Paul. So when you meet with a non-believer, you must have the BC and AD before you've lived a life of a non-believer, a religious person, and then after the AD. That's how Paul makes a testimony before the re incident of Damascus. I was a persecutor. I did it with my own efforts. My background was spectacular. But after I met Jesus Christ, it is all rubbish. And that's how he changed it. You must have a BC and AD. Those who don't have this, I'm not sure if that person receives salvation or not. Surprisingly, there are many people like that. Those people who shake upon situations and people questioning if that person receives salvation or not. And they're questioning themselves. Me pray, God, for those who don't have the answer may you be able to have 
the experience of the spiritual Damascus. How can this be? The answer lies in the word found in verse 20 of the passage, immediately. The transformation in my life and growth in my faith depends on whether I act immediately or not. If you don't act immediately, the devil cunningly sows the seed of later. There's a saying, the devil's time is tomorrow and God's time is today. There are such words. The devil's characteristic is to procrastinate. Is today the only day? There's next week. He keeps on making us procrastinate until we die. And then what happens? We have conflicts. It becomes vague. That is why when I heard the voice of God upon prayer, when I had the realization upon the word, if something touches my heart, I immediately put it into action. Talking with family, it's my family always filled with the Holy Spirit. As they have meetings, it gets messed up whether I have or not immediately. It is putting it into action. That's how I lived. Being born a Christian, being used by God until now. After the year 79 of September. Yes. After that choice, there are many times when I regret but upon my lips, I just confess it and follow it. Prayer, evangelism, devotion, I say I will do it and I follow it because I spit out my words so I have to be responsible for it. Because I know my weaknesses, I say it and follow it. And that's how we receive answers. The walk of faith that we receive answers? It's when the word of God comes to your heart as the Rema, and then you have to do it immediately. Are you going to put it into action or not? I don't discuss it with others as I pray. God tells me and re makes me realize. Oh yes, that is so. And then it's immediately. And then there is one more thing, which is like a two sides of a coin, and that is the spiritual synergy of being continuous. It is not the song always sung by Nauna, but rather the continuation in prayer. Ephesians 6.18 reads, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. In the previous translation of the Bible, it says praying always with all prayer and supplication with the Spirit, always, continuously. We must live a life of 24 that clings to God's covenant. When your life surpasses our level environment and reaches the level of 25, the blessing of the throne will come upon us. This is when we will live a life that creates the eternal blessing internal masterpiece. I bless you in the name of the Lord, that may all believers of you and church live a life of the covenant of the CVDIP that holds on to the preached word from the pulpit, praying unceasingly and immediately putting into action. Number two, the prepared disciple Ananias. Verse 10 reads, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in the vision, Ananias, and he said to him, here I am, Lord. The Lord prepared one of the 70 disciples named Ananias for the sake of Saul. In verse 6 of the passage, it is mentioned that God had already revealed this fact to Saul, saying, But rise and enter into the city, and you will be told that you are to do. In Acts chapter 9, it becomes evident that Saul did not was not only the vessel chosen by God, and then I too was chosen by God and used as an instrument for transformation. In Acts 22:12, Apostle Paul praises Ananias to all the Jews living in Damascus, 
emphasizing that there was a disciple who lived according to God's word. It was clear and certain. However, in verse 11, we see that Ananias becomes quite perplexed upon hearing the voice of the Lord instructing him to go and find Saul during his prayer. At that time, Saul had a notorious reputation of being a persecutor, and Ananias was aware that Saul had come to Damascus to arrest the believers of Jesus. It was at that point when the Lord clearly explains to Ananias the definite reason why he should go. Verses 15 to 16 reads, But the Lord said to him, For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. It is because Saul has been chosen by God himself as a vessel for the evangelization of the Gentiles. The voice that Ananias ha heard contained God's spiritual plan and exhortation. He did not say, oh, I'll pray about it. The excuse of many people is saying, I'll pray about it. It's a lie. That's all a fake. May you do it immediately. He immediately goes to find Saul. Thus, one characteristic of a vessel chosen by God is to act immediately. Those who don't do it immediately are not chosen by God in that aspect. May you be immediate. If you have other motives and is calculative, then you'll not be used and guided by God. Starting from Peter, Paul, it's very simple. Immediately. It's doing it immediately. When Ananias met Saul and laid his hands on the name of Jesus Christ, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and the scales that had covered Saul's eyes fell off and restored his sight. Afterwards, receives baptism from Ananias and ate food gaining strength. He spent several days with the disciples in Damascus and immediately began proclaiming Jesus as the Christ, testifying the truth of the gospel. It is important how Saul was able to immediately proclaim the truth of the Bible, as it is the gospel. It is the important time schedule for us to understand how Saul was able to immediately proclaim the truth of the gospel that Jesus is the Christ. It is because of Ananias' team ministry. Your team ministry is so important. Ananias was a trained worker. His message was all organized like Stephen. So precisely, who is Saul? Ananias gave a precise team ministry. Who is Ananias? What was the core of the team ministry? Ananias conveyed to Saul of the five core aspects of the gospel that was mentioned in Acts chapter 1. First, it is that Jesus is the Christ who fulfills the roles of the prophet, priest, and king. He is the Christ. And it means that he is the answer to all your life, all your problems. So those who believe in Jesus, your problems have been finished. You are the only one who has those misconceptions. But if you say that you believe in Jesus, your life's problems have been finished. It's that you make problems, but it is finished. Amen. You don't need to have worries in your faces. Why do you have so many complaints? Why are you so depressed where you cannot sleep at night? 
and look down upon ourselves that is being deceived by Satan. I was like that in the past, being deceived. Not even being able to go in the bus. Not being able to look at other people, whether you believe it or not, it was like that. Being bounded by Satan, I went to church. I went to church, but it was still like that. I received gifts and I spoke in tongues, but it was still like that. May you believe that it has been finished. Number two. Jesus Christ had resurrected and he's still alive right now. What does that mean? It means that he is completely responsible for past, present, and future. It's not having worries and having conflicts about what we have to do. Just cast it onto God. That's what I do. Problems? It doesn't matter. Jesus is the Christ. May show that Jesus is the Christ. There are no unsolved problems. There is no homework. He will be responsible. Number three. It is that the Holy Spirit of the Lord is with us now, guiding and working upon us. He's with us right now. With. It's not that he is somewhere very far away. There is that prayer that you call out, but there's also the prayer that you silently do. Having holy meditation as he listens because he's with us. How is he with us? By the Holy Spirit. Fourth, it is that we have been called as witnesses to testify the gospel to the ends of the earth. Lastly, it is that Jesus will come again as the Lord on his second coming and judgment. It is the eternal guaranteed future. When you die, it's all finished. It's all been guaranteed. You have to live with this living oak. So there is the reason to proclaim the gospel. Why do you have to do the team of three? It's that team ministry. The team ministry of Ananias. So Saul was so smart. Listening to this, it was such an answer to him. All the questions that he had. Yes, this is what it is. So listening to team ministry of Pastor Ryu, I received the answer of life. Jesus is the Christ. To tell us time. He had finished everything on the cross and this is what it means. It finished on that day. So Ananias the ministry. So the word was coming inside him and it was the answer. So what is that? It is Jesus Christ, only the kingdom of God, and only the filling of the Holy Spirit. It is being resoluted in that. So, non-believers, they receive the team ministry of disbelief so well. Oh, that person did this, that person did that. And it is imprinted in them. But for the sermon, they forget it in the parking lot. So that is the trickery of Satan. Even for us. God has called us and given us the church duty. You must have 
the spiritual identity that you are the chosen vessel. You must have the covenantal challenge with the clear heavenly mandate calling and mission. Let us confess together. I'm a vessel chosen by God. You're a vessel chosen by God. May you pray like that. God, you have chosen me. Amen. May you give me power to be able to endure that. I bless all believers of Yaman Church in the name of the Lord to have the spiritual identity like Ananias. This is the conclusion. The Jewish theologist Abraham Joshua Heschel had pointed to the modern people to be the messengers who have lost the message. They are sent to the world, but they have forgotten why they have come. The message, the will of God, must be held to live a powerful life. We live forgetting why we have become the church duty that we have. Most people are like that. When we hold on to God's will, our life will be powerful. As Apostle Paul had firmly held on to the word of Acts 9.15, after the incident of Damascus without hindrance, he went into the field of the Gentiles, risking his life. As Jesus was doing his public ministry, he set all instructions upon fulfilling the will of God. John 6, 39-40 reveals that Jesus had what Jesus had said to be God's will was. And this is the will of of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me but raise it up on the last day for this is the will of my father that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day it is the same reason that God has chosen us the reason that he has chosen us is to save one more soul and go to heaven And you living, it's having a mission. Why are you always in your room? Why are you, you always thinking about other things? It is to save souls. That's why we're doing the theme of theory at church. Upon all believers of you on church. May you be able to hold on to God's absolute will and goal. And may you be the chosen vessels to save lives and stand as the main figures of the Team of Three movement and the Three movements. Dear Father God, thank you for choosing us. Thank you for giving us eternal life upon the church duty. May you be used as the ones who saves the souls. May you not be deceived by the situations, hold on to the identity of God, and be able to enjoy that we have been chosen. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, Amen.